on our agenda today, we have um, exposing some of the, the, the common the challenges uh, that uh, you know we often hear about cultural authenticity and this is very much a debatable and sometimes uh, it's one of the hotter topics when we talk about uh, tourism and, and authenticity um, because there is a lot of different opinions on, on how to go about it. We're going to do some revealing the opportunities and we will have questions and answers and then also again how to become part of the a Aboriginal tourism Ontario. And just moving forward, some of the common challenges that we see um, with cultural authenticity certainly is, you know, a selling of culture, what to share, what's appropriate, um, and you know, how do you regulate that even in your in your own community? Um, how do you live up to that, uh, those standards, just even in your own business? Um, and then how do you regulate authenticity? I mean, if someone's willing to share, you know, how do you, um, an entrepreneur wants to share his ways, how do you come across and say, no, you can't do that? Um, so that's, you know, some of the challenges too, to make sure that it's the real deal. Um, coming up with a common definition is always a uh, challenge. There's no doubt. Um, there are different definitions of what that means, but certainly um, there is, uh, as we'll see in the opportunities, there is a resource now that we can say for Aboriginal tourism and that uh, is sort of a common um, definition that can be used. What resources are available? Again, um, you know, a lot of people are starting from scratch with this, so a challenge for them is, is where do I even start? Um, what is the process and, and how do I get a, how do I actually establish um, some protocols and um, guidelines? And then of course the last challenge that, uh, and there are many, but these are the most notable, um, how to implement cultural standards and guidelines. So, you know, you may have them, but, um, you know, as a community or as an association, how do you, how do you implement them and, and then maintain them? So that's some of the common challenges that uh, that we see. And I would just, you know, just kind of going back a little bit and understanding why um, there is such a movement towards cultural tourism. You know, you'll hear, you know, hear phrases like off the beaten track um, or, you know, responsible tourism, um, controlled tourism, small group tourism, uh, a number of uh, different uh, ways and nomenclatures and all it stems from is really that there is now um, and sort of always has been but now even more with the baby boomers um, and the educational component but people are looking for that sensitivity um, that understanding that gaining of new knowledge and um, certainly learning about another culture and that is the drive for them to find something that is unique um, that is not commercial, um, that is not corporate driven, but really just uh, almost by accident. And what I mean by that is there are times when you've traveled, I'm sure, that um, you know you may have been walking through a small town and then you came down and you saw some local fishermen and you went to talk to them. The next thing you know, you're, um, you're watching what they're doing and then they invite you to have dinner with their family and it is probably the most memorable, unplanned experience you'll ever have, and, and it was authentic. And so travelers are always in search of this, looking for that, for that wonderful moment where they can achieve this authenticity. Now with Aboriginal tourism um, and Indigenous tourism worldwide, there is a huge attraction um, to this because really this is to everyone um, the most, you know, whether it be spiritual, sacred, um, whether it be just technologies that are used, um, stories, etc. This is the most savored by tourists. So it really puts Aboriginal tourism in, in a great position. But still, we have to look at what those challenges are when we say what's authentic and what's not. Um, well, Kevin, when he does join us, if he doesn't, we'll be We'll be rolling with uh, another presentation, um, but Kevin is, for you, uh, I'm sure a lot of you know uh, Kevin Ishkabigan, 
He is the uh, Chief Executive Officer at Great Spirit Circle Trail and uh, he uh, works with the Great Spirit Circle Trail Tour Company and of course these initiatives have uh, been successful in growing the tourism industry in, in the Manitoulin Island. Um, he's also an Executive com uh, Committee member with the um, Aboriginal Tourism Association of Canada uh, which was formerly I believe the Tourism Marketing Partnership and he's a Board of Director of Northeastern Ontario Tourism a partner in Spirit Island Adventures with his wonderful wife and uh, is the Vice President I believe at Tourism Northern Ontario. There's no doubt Kevin is a pillar of uh, strength and commitment for tourism development and economic development um, and has done some pretty amazing things and it should be noted that Kevin is also the one who has um, spearheaded the ATO Aboriginal Tourism Ontario initiative uh, with tirelessly and unwavering uh, loyalty. Uh, it's been you know, uh, not an easy feat, but uh, um, I think things are going and we're finally getting some uh, movement, so kudos to, to Kevin. So one of the um, resources that currently is out there is the Aboriginal Cultural Experiences uh, National Guidelines. And I'm not sure if everyone is familiar um, with this, but one of the one of the, the uses in having this resource is is that it not only does it give you sort of a um, a generic checklist, but it also gives you some protocol <clears throat> and guidelines. Excuse me. And I think this is an amazing resource to start off with, whether it be for your community, um, your association, or just your own individual business. Um, an easy to use checklist. Now this has been sort of adopted by provinces uh, national wide under the Aboriginal Tourism Association of Canada so it's got some blessings and I know that um, certainly you know, Great Spirit Circle Trail and Kevin was instrumental in helping put this together. Um, as a matter of fact Great Spirit Circle Trail has um, and uses their own guidelines and protocol for, for authenticity so it has worked great resource um, and certainly we'll be sharing, uh, we'll send all of you the link after um, just so you don't have to try to copy this but within that link like I said to you, you will see it, it's a, it's a very short section probably about three or four pages and you'll see that it is very very useful um, in, in helping you establish some of those guidelines. One of the strategies that Aboriginal Tourism Ontario is looking at, now there's going to be a Aboriginal Tourism update, a strategy update for 2015 that's coming just shortly and should be done in the early fall. Um, and as some of you already know, or you may have been contacted by by uh, CES under ATO, trying to get your feedback and, and helping form this strategy. Um, but one of the components in there is certainly that uh, we want to follow um, how we can have cultural authenticity work uh, for Aboriginal Tourism Ontario. And there's four guiding strategies for that really. And um, the first is to celebrate and create awareness of environmental and cultural diversity, uh, support the growth of authentic cultural tourism, a non-regulating approach that recognizes and celebrates businesses. And this is a really key um, point in the non-regulating. And you know, you know, it's one thing to say, well, how do you regulate if you're not going to regulate? Um, how do you ensure? But, you know, I think if it's a supportive approach, it can really be people um, sort of policing them, themselves and um, a recognition that goes and celebrates those businesses so um, they can certainly achieve, achieve some sort of delegation. But um, more helpful than you don't fit um, and you get an X. I think that's the wrong approach. And, and so certainly uh, I agree with the Aboriginal Tourism uh, strategy in that having a non-regulating uh, way of doing that. Approve and implement the four P's of cultural tourism. And I just want to show you how this works. You'll notice in the middle there's the preservers and on the outside there's the partners, promoters and packagers. And those are the sort of the four P's. And these four P's simply represent um, how the partners are on the on the circle at the very top at 12 o'clock. Um, they are the organizations, corporations, government bodies um, that 
that sponsor or work with and um, support uh, Aboriginal tourism. So whether that be, you know, tourism, one of the RTOs, um, whether that be, you know, the Minister of, of Cultural Tourism and Sport, etc. So those are the partners and um, associations that would help this. Um, on the other side, um, you'll see packagers. Now, packagers are, are big businesses that offer and integrate Aboriginal tourism products and services. And so what this basically uh, means is, is that if, let's say, there's a bed and breakfast and they say, you know what, in your one night's sleep, you'll also be able to partake in a feast um, that, uh, or a shore lunch that takes place at, a certain, at 11.30 um, and it's packaged into the price. So those are the packagers. And then there's the promoters. And these are the people that are really, you know, you would see at uh, Rendezvous Canada, uh, tour operators, RTOs, travel agencies, even associations, DMOs, etc., that help uh, promote Aboriginal tourism products. And the very, very um, center, which is the most important, is what we consider the preservers. Um, and the preservers are really going to be the uh, true, authentic service providers of tourism. So, um, again, looking at some of those guidelines, those national gu guidelines um, from Aboriginal Tourism Association Canada, there's very much fits the same, but this is a person that is obviously very connected to their culture and is sharing their culture in a responsible way, and certainly it is an authentic experience um, in the true definition of showing the cultural ways, and that is, you know, uh, their, the way of life. Um, and today and in the past, and certainly as a person who wants to uh, embrace embrace their uh, their belief and carry on their traditions and preserve their culture. So those are the preservers, and we think that that's a really nice way of um, letting everybody be involved, and it's a model that would help uh, build culturally authentic uh, products and services. Um, however, it's one that is very supportive and, um, you know, the, the, the reason why, for example, that this came up is, is that, you know, if you were an Aboriginal or Indigenous person and you're, no doubt, and you opened up a motel um, and, you know, is that, you know, considered an authentic because you may share some um, of your values or um, some of your ways with with tourists, does that make you an authentic, does that make you a preserver? Well, not necessarily, no, but if there's someone that's just focusing on sharing their culture, um, great, uh, that's a little bit more authentic, so this will, this will sort of govern that. Just before we get to our presentation, um, who we have, Amanda. Now, for, I don't know if any Anybody here online participated at the, the Aboriginal uh, Tur Tourism Ontario Business Conference. However, Amanda is from our team, and she had um, she had uh, recently went to India and to explore, um, you know, authenticity at its best. So, uh, one of the great things is she got to see firsthand, and I think that there's an element that you know, people often talk about in in being authentic, and that is, you know, this the this staging of authenticity, what's real and what's not, and what it's referred to as the front stage, and sort of the backstage. So the front stage is really, you know, if you were to come up and you know see um, uh, some dancers in regalia, and they are putting it on, and there's uh, a feast going on, all of these things going on, and the tourists would see this. Well, the other side of it is in the backstage. So, you know, now once these people are off of stage, and um, what are they practicing, and how are their um, lives, are their lives authentic, and are they practicing sort of what they're preaching, um, whether that be environmental stewardship, whether that be how they're giving back to the community, whether that be how they're transferring knowledge. So there's sort of two sides to, to this 
authenticity, which is where the great debate comes in because some people will just be great on stage, but they won't be backstage and then tourists are the ones that would say, oh, yeah, it was a good show, but you know, this is what I noticed after or you know, when I got to know them a little bit more, I found out that was more stage. So something to think about. So when Amanda went to India, she was sort of looking for um, this place where they had both the front stage and the back stage clearly authentic. And it was very much a, a, a place that she went to where it was inviting and spontaneous. So that wasn't too many planned things. You actually were just integrated into the community, which I think is a wonderful, um, a wonderful way of authentic tourism working. So Amanda, I'm going to ask you if you'd like to share your story um, with us, uh, with India, and just walk us through your experience with uh, authentic tourism. Great. Um, <laughs> happy to uh, happy to share my story, and uh, and I hope that it um, inspires some of you and just shares. Uh, what it actually, you know, you can you can have something just very simple uh, when it comes to uh, cultural being culturally authentic and just be true true to yourself. As Clinton mentioned I had the the privilege of uh, traveling to India uh, this uh, past December on uh, it was on a fam tour uh, to meet with uh, a company called Heritage uh, Tourism that just started a non-for-profit grassroots ecotourism project uh, in the state of Orissa, which in India, it's one of the, the less traveled states. Uh, India is such a diverse country and has, you know, there are all their iconic destinations, um, but really they, they have so much more to offer too. So, um, and I think that's kind of, there's a lot of similarities uh, with the area that I visited uh, and um, comparing it to some of the unique experiences and opportunities that are here in Canada. So um, where it all starts is, is first of all just having the vision. So, so what do you want to share and um, you know when you open your doors to sharing your culture you just um, you want it to, to come from a good place and uh, and so so the vision with the Desia Ecotourism Project, it's situated in the heart of several tribal and indigenous communities in um, uh, the inland reg region of, uh, it's called the Koraput Valley. And uh, so as, as you can see from this photo, uh, very basic, very grassroots, and it's all built on the model to empower uh, the local community members to really take the ownership and control over this project and, and provide a sustainable form of income for, for future generations and also celebrates just the diversity in, in the region too. So all the little uh, grass huts that uh, you can see are all there um, for, for different artists to come and showcase their work and for other small micro businesses to to operate, so it's kind of that that hub just to celebrate the the talent that is amongst all of these communities. And uh, and the partner with Heritage Tourism, he saw this vision and saw this opportunity, so he uh, pushed uh, to to move it forward, and and that's. Uh, him on the side there with the, the white shirt, so that's uh, Yuga Brat, uh, or uh, his nickname's Boo Boo, and just uh, has done some incredible work uh, with the communities uh, of finding uh, just, uh, and, and where his heart is too, like he just loves, loves, loves sharing culture, loves st um, just listening to stories and just celebrating um, the, the local communities for who they are and then sharing their story. So it's very um, simply based and, and uh, um, when it comes to sharing your culture. 
and it is really important to when you start a project like this is to have that community involvement and support and I know in the beginning stages uh, Yuga Brett personally um, you know would would stay and uh, be part of the communities from start to finish too and um, d involved with the training process making sure that everything um, all, you know there was those those guidelines and protocol that come along with the tourism industry but that it would really came from um, the community members themselves and, and and sharing their culture and some activities are, are super simple like just going and having a picnic with uh, with the crew this is the, the local team there and um, just eating, sharing stories, even, you know, a, a lot of people didn't really even speak English, but you're there and you're sharing that moment and, and it comes from a good place. And, and uh, another one of my simple, um, just a simple activity, I would go with uh, some of the girls and they would just, you know, I'd go and meet their families and, and just seeing how proud they were to kind of show me around and, and then you just kind of joke around so it's just that true cultural exchange and not being you know s sold in any any way and but it's just like making friends and connecting with, with people and and that's I think what a lot of people are looking for So here's uh, me again with the crew here. So, so they all went through training program and uh, to, to run the Desia project, and and you could see they're they're really uh, proud to be involved and 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 do take ownership of the project. So, uh, Yuga Brat is more kind of the um, back end behind the scenes that just you know provided the the um, expertise to to kind of make them uh, run run this project. So. Um, yeah, it's just a, they're doing some really great work out there. So again, going to the whole cultural authenticity part of it, um, with every aspect they, they build in and share their, their tribal heritage. So even in the uh, local architecture, so this is where the guests stay, so they used uh, influences from uh, traditional housing and got a designer to, to design it and make a really beautiful, unique place to stay. It was one of the most unique places I stayed in. And uh, even the, the washroom was just so cool with the, the rocks and they have little different artwork on the rocks and and uh, yeah, so even with um, designing your projects and, and accommodations, always look into opportunities of just how it can just, you know, share a story on its own. And again, just getting a feel for the place. So, so that in itself just evokes a feeling and, and makes it special and has a whole story behind it. And again, using this community involvement, uh, empowering the youth, instilling pride and ownership, um, those are all things. And then, you know, I find when, when that's all enforced, that's when, you know, you, you are true to being culturally and authentic because you're just, you're there and, and you see, you attract a certain type of visitor as well. So just hanging out with the, here's the girls here, we're, we're on our way to the picnic. And, uh, and again, just, just how proud they are to work there. And, and uh, when, when those values are instilled and, and, uh, and uh, sharing their culture, it's just, the results are just great. And uh, with this project too, there's all these great spin-off opportunities uh, in the communities. There's um, sharing different agricultural practices and creating awareness uh, between that. Uh, the different communities in that area now help each other. So there's all these great um, additional local opportunities are, are happening just from doing this grassroots approach. And also there's the whole bridging cultural divides and creating that awareness and an understanding of 
of their culture and also understanding and, and sharing um, about our culture. So, um, for example, when I went to visit, I was showing pictures of, of my home and, and stories of Canada, and then I was learning, obviously, about their culture. So, so just encouraging moments uh, like that with your visitors and, and with your experiences are important, too, and it creates that really long-lasting uh, relationship and that strong connection to a place and, and stories and, and all those stories to share and, and word of mouth for your visitors is so important and those are what's going to keep people coming back and keep people recommending your places. So uh, now just kind of leaving you with some inspiration. So uh, if any of you have a, a, a tourism dream, uh, the main thing that you need is just the passion to move it forward and uh, empowering um, whether it's uh, your community members or a team of people just to, to make it happen. And uh, yeah, and that's again, the heart of, of cultural tourism and just be true to yourself. Um. Amanda, I just, I just, there's a few things that I wanted to ask you. Yeah. And just to, to, to go back on, um, the theme that we, you know, we recognize just as, as researchers and and going out and seeing these best practices. Mm -hmm. One of the things is the simplicity. Yes. Um, the simplicity of the even the infrastructure, um, the simplicity of the the product. So this, to be authentic, does not have to be commercially presented. Again, that front stage of, oh, they do 20 of these shows a day. And mm -hmm. cer certainly by looking at what happened um, on your experience, um, as simple as it was, um, less is more. Yes, yes, definitely. And like I said, one of my, my favorite things to do is just to hang out with the girls and go and meet their families, walk through their village, and and you're joking around and and just creating that bond and that relationship again, which um, you know is that true cultural exchange, and and those are the moments that create long-lasting memories and and have stories to share and yeah. yeah. And certainly, you know, some of those activities, and this is another thing that's sort of building the product itself, um, some of those activities for entrepreneurs starting out or groups or communities starting out, they, you know, there's sometimes the feeling that it needs to be done um, on a larger scale with a lot of investment as far as, 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 far as money. But what uh, I've heard you say is, is this the champion um, it's really just the, the grassroots initiative. It's that it's a person really taking on and making something of a space and animating it more than it is a person getting a, you know, a half a million dollar or a million dollar, um, you know, business plan. It's just that champion. Yeah, and uh, actually, the just a really good example of this. Um, I was showing the pictures of the accommodation facilities, and. Uh, when the first building was built, um, they had a, a professional that was there and, and that they hired and paid to do it. And uh, then the community was involved with that process. And just from learning the skills and, and from being a part of it, they then just built the whole other building that could also accommodate additional tourists. They, did, they built it themselves because of that passion. They, they didn't have the money to hire someone for another building, so they just took it upon themselves. So, um, yeah, just having that strong community leaders uh, and um, just that champion is, is what makes things really successful. Great. And the other thing that, um, just as far as the, um, what they did, Talk about more of the what we call the backstage. So, you know, certainly when a tourist came, um, they entertained the tourists through activities, um, and and I'm sure there was other local activities that you could do and engage in in workshops and whatnot. But what about when the tourist leaves? What goes on there? Uh, when the well, I had the privilege just because I I kind of saw some of the behind the scenes stuff. 
and I actually sat in, um, you know, after uh, a like kind of a staff meeting, and so again, it was is Yuga Yuga Brat meeting with the local staff, asking them, um, you know, about how to, uh, you know, enhance the experiences that they do offer, what they can can do to um, also like keep uh, the staff. Uh, happy and engaged as well. So in their culture, for example, um, they have a lot of um, folk songs with a lot of meaning. So they're thinking just for team building and team morale, just to have their own kind of behind the scenes protocol to keep the staff happy and engaged and, and always, again, empowering them to, to share ideas and be a part of the process as well. And, uh, and that's one thing that they're, they're, they're doing a really great job with and, and again, um, you know, empowering um, the staff to to take that leadership position too. So and it does show to visitors when they come and, and you see that it's um, it's, uh, you know, it's evident. So uh, so, yeah, it was a, a really great experience just to kind of sit in and watch uh, a staff meeting and, and then see the, the team morale and, and how everyone kind of has a voice and, and a part of the business too. Yeah, so that's a lovely sentiment in itself. So often we focus on the customer, the customer, and, and certainly that's important to have a, that, but um, keeping, keeping yourselves happy with what you're doing and how you're presenting your traditions and your culture um, and having protocol and guidelines uh, off, off stage and backstage, I think is is really cool. So that's mm -hmm. great. Now, what about the other things as far as walking the talk? Um, you know, you know, you mentioned in, in the gardens, and what do they do for the community itself? Like, how does this benefit the community uh, outside of the tourists coming? Uh, well, outside of tourists coming, it's um, yeah, looking into all those spin-off opportunities. So. Um, promoting sustainable agriculture for one of them. So it's, you know, it's something that's interesting to take visitors to, yes, but it's also just um, something that's needed in the communities. And because it's a, a, they use a regional approach, so there's about seven or eight communities that are part of this pro uh, uh, project. So looking at how these communities can help each other, provide support, uh, a support, supportive network. Uh, there's also, they just started a project, um, a fair trade project as well. So um, working with the, the local arts and, and, and craftsmen in the, in the communities and looking at ways for them to start their own small businesses and, and using, based on the principles of fair trade, and selling to um, you know larger markets in the state throughout India and and eventually looking at international markets to sell those the products as well. So there's all these um, you know spin-off opportunities and 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 you find that there's all these hidden talents in the community. So it's you know it's uh, when you when you market as um, you know, especially internationally, then it could potentially lead to addition, additional small business creation in a variety of different aspects. Great. And, you know, it just reminded me when you said uh, authenticity, um, you know, with what they're doing with the, the crafts, etc. it should be noted that, you know, authenticity comes in two forms. It really comes in goods and experiences. So, um, goods are things that can be physically bought, such as you know jewelry, pottery, paintings, um, and other commodities that can be physically uh, brought home with you. Um, and certainly, the other side is the experience, which you know includes performance, dances, feasts, etc., um, and just some of those cultural exchanges. And so, I think having those two things, you know, even with authenticity, um, with the communities having their own protocol, um, I think that's where it needs to start with, is the communities or the businesses, um, you know, developing their own protocol, certainly having guidelines to work with, but what really, really makes it work is doing it their way. Um, would you say that's a fair statement? 
Yes, definitely. I agree because it, it's and uh, again, just using that community community involvement and um, through all stages too, from from start to finish. So, um, yeah, I definitely agree. Okay, um, and then there's also something else that I thought was unique about you know having this authentic model that works. Um, and you know we've seen this sort of model here in Canada, of course, but uh, it's more prevalent in real um, uh, villages such as India, uh, from where I come from in South Africa. We've we've seen this, but there's a hub. And can you just speak to what that hub does in that in that model? Mm -hmm. So um, that hub. So that's what the the DESIA uh, ecotourism project essentially is. So yes, it provides opportunities with tourism, but it also provides that space uh, for the community to, um, you know, uh, employment opportunities. Uh, people go through the whole training process, um, whether they want to be a guide or manage the facility, take care of the rooms, um, start your own small micro business, whether it's selling crafts or, or doing agricultural tours. Uh, they also have uh, one of the huts dedicated to before and after school programming for the youth in the community too. So it's just this multi-purpose center um, yeah. that is so much more than tourism. Yeah, and I know we've you know we've recommended you know that the you know and and, and it's working um, even in Canada where uh, I think Indigenous people are, in my opinion, stewards um, of the world. So having projects, whether it be with the forestry or the water, or everything you know, something like that tied into it, is also a wonderful a wonderful way in sharing and educating um, how important that is. We just have one question for you uh, from Kim. Uh, Amanda, and that's how long were you there, and how long does a tourist stay at the village? Uh, so I was there uh, on site for probably four days, and then I, I toured uh, to a few destination, other destinations. But uh, um, it's basically, however, I would say on average maybe four to five days of, of staying there as a tourist. There are also opportunities to stay there and uh, be more involved and, and actually uh, volunteer uh, and uh, be part of the project as well. Yeah, and, and that's an interesting one too because um, we had, um, years back, we had worked on Easter Island uh, and I had actually went up there to work with some of the um, indigenous people, the Rapa Nui. Uh, people. And one of the things that we did, we started off with just a bed and breakfast and um, bed and breakfast sort of setups. But they were done very quite, you know, authentically. It was basically you were living with the, with the local um, and it centered around having, you know, meals with them and they prepare some of the local meals. Um, and it was that sort of engagement and transfer. But I also had the opportunity while I stayed with one of the, the uh, the Rapa Nui was to work on his um, farm, uh, this little garden he had, uh, probably about an acre. So we went out and there was a lot of root vegetables that they use and whatnot. So we actually went out and, and uh, did some work, um, harvested and you know it was sort of that sort of farm to table idea. But um, I volunteered my time so you know, it was quite funny because I, I teased the gentleman and I said to him, I said, this is great. You, you know, you've got me coming out here. I'm paying you and I'm working for you. So <laughs> it, was quite, but it, was, it was a great experience nonetheless. Um, and so, I mean, that can take place too. And, you know, I think to be authentic, you've got to take a step back and go, look, we're not looking for a, you know, Disney experience here. We're not looking for everything to be, you know, absolutely perfect more it's about immersing um, and taking people into um, your world whatever that might be but uh, the authenticity will come through the heart mm -hmm. definitely yeah um, and, the, and the whole concept I think of volunteer uh, and travel is a growing 
people want to be more involved when they come and um, if there is a way for people to be involved as a volunteer or are helping out with with various specific projects or um, you know people are looking for those types of experiences nowadays absolutely and incidentally I'm just gonna you know three reason uh, three reasons I have here that people look for authenticity and it was done by the, the University of BC and I thought I'd share it with you but one uh, people are unsatisfied with their society and see it as fake uh, having an authentic experience uh, appears to be something real uh, authenticity number two authenticity has the image of being unspoiled either culturally spiritually or naturally and tourists want to find these areas so you know that unspoiled um, that it cannot be commercial and so often we see that little bit of conflict of it looks too much like a stage it is a stage and so people are like the show's over and they want to go on to something else if it's simplified and if it's true and if it's authentic people will just want to stay and you don't have to entertain them all the time the third is people think that if they have an authentic experience then they have a complete understanding of the world um, and so often I know Amanda just in your experience when you went to India you know um, from the yoga to the, um, the spirituality to so many things that uh, you, you adopted and in you know sort of bettered your life because of that experience that in the, at an exchange that you had in India oh yeah definitely it's um, when you have those authentic experiences you create this long-lasting connection to the people that you meet and the, and the particular place that you experience that in and uh, and um, yeah and it is life life changing and you learn values that you want to in, apply to your own life and continue to, to share with other people that are you know, in your life as well and yeah it's just a, a great thing yeah and um, you know I, I guess that the, the big takeaway um, aside from you know there are resources for you to have a starting point to help you consider both you know how you want to do this on the front stage and how you want to do this in the backstage uh, I certainly think it's a useful resource again with the the ATAC and we'll send it out to you um, but I really think if you're going to do this look at simplicity um, and look at doing it your way um, that's got to be you know it's got to be the essence of what makes the true you know the true experience is to do it your way because that's authentic um, and so you got to stick to that look at not using a lot in in capital for infrastructure etc um, try to keep it as natural as possible um, whatever that means to you and your community and I think that don't look for um, always trying to have everything packaged perfectly if you are providing the authentic experience for days uh, in, in Amanda's case it was the four to five days which Kim had asked if you're looking at doing something like that you know it's what I said to a group um, once I was working with in Quebec it's um, you know if if you were to wake up one day um, with a, a you know a hunter is not going to say to you I'm going to go out and get my moose on September 27th at 1 p.m. and you can't market that um, so you if you're an indigenous person and you know if you wake up that day you just have to have that flexibility if you have visitors staying for a while to say you know what here's a range of experiences where we may do but it's going to be dependent on weather it's going to be dependent on this but you know you will be immersed um, so not trying to have it always so perfectly by the hour but more by the experience because that's wonderful in itself uh, nobody needs to be exhausted over four days um, trying to do so many things okay I will just quickly um, mention that if anyone is interested in um, for the Aboriginal tourism material being involved in um, working with the four uh, four P's um, or the authenticity program that's being considered um, whether it be in an advisory role um, or whether it just to be involved and to have your voices heard could you please just send us uh, send us a note and um, right here 
at um, info at cesclients.com and we will certainly make sure that you're included um, as we go through this and again there's an opportunity for whether it be an advisory role or even if you're a champion and you want to be involved with Aboriginal Tourism Ontario and, and on a board level please let us know your interest um, that would be great um, Aboriginal Tourism Ontario and I know uh, Kevin who unfortunately couldn't be here today is really uh, honed in that this needs to be all of Ontario and it needs to have all voices heard so that would be that would be great if you if you could help us with that. Um, I want to thank you all from uh, Aboriginal Tourism Ontario for joining us. I know how busy it is. It's summer. And it's actually the peak of tourism. So for you to be here means an incredible uh, amount to uh, to Aboriginal Tourism Ontario. And um, just thank you for being here.